So our first speaker today is Professor Steve Simon from the University of Oxford. I'm sure many people here know Professor Simon because of his influential research in topological matter and the fractional quantum Hall effect, as well as for his popular solid state physics textbook. He'll be speaking today about topologically ordered matter and why we should be interested. Thank you very much for being here, Professor Simon. Please feel free to start when you're ready. Okay, let me uh, share my screen here. I cannot share while well, okay, now I just share, share, share. Okay, um, well, first, um, let's see if it shares correctly. Yeah, that looks good. And that looks good and that looks good. Great, um, so you should see my title coming up. Yes, there it is. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure and an honor to be starting this, this nice conference. Um, I, I agreed to give this talk a, a little while ago and I only uh, last week looked at the list of the other speakers, which is, is actually quite a nice list. Indeed, it's, it's going to be a very nice, nice conference. Um, but you know, in, in retrospect, I, I, um, it might've been a little bit more useful for me to give um, introductions to some of the science in, in the field that will help you understand the talks that, um, that come later. Because I think a lot of the talks are gonna be fairly focused around the same, same rough subject area. Um, instead, I'm going to give an introductory talk that might give you an idea of why it is so many people are interested in this field, but it's not likely to help you understand the talks that come that come later. Nonetheless, I hope you'll find it uh, to be interested in explaining why you should care about, about topologically ordered matter and what fundamentally topologically ordered matter uh, actually is. So the subject of topologically ordered matter is, is a subject that cuts across many fields of uh, modern physics. Obviously, within condensed matter physics, it's a, it's a subject that a lot of people study, and you hear a lot about that this week, I suspect. Um, but it also occurs in um, quantum information theory that um, a lot of uh, what we call quantum error correcting codes are fundamentally based on the ideas of topologically ordered matter. So if you're from that field, uh, this may also sound familiar, but in a slightly different way. And many of the, the origins of the field of topologically ordered matter actually stem from high energy physics, particularly people starting in the 1980s or so, who were trying to understand quantum gravity. But the real origins of topologically ordered matter go back much further, way back into the 1800s to 1867, somewhere up in Scotland. And that's where I'm going to start uh, my story. So off in Scotland in, in 1867, there were two very well-known scientists. One, I'm sure you all know, uh, William Thomson, who is better named by, known by the name uh, Lord Kelvin. And I'm sure I don't have to tell you all of the the things that uh, Kelvin did. And the other person is uh, much less known, a guy by the name of Peter Tate. Now, Peter Tate uh, was a very good scientist in his own right. He was a very close friend of, of Lord Kelvin and they worked together throughout their lives. Uh, both of them lived somewhere up in Scotland, just close enough together to uh, visit each other and talk about, about uh, science every, every now and then. Anyway, in 1867, they were interested in a phenomenon of uh, fluid flow, actually. It was a phenomenon that everyone was familiar with. It's the phenomenon of a, of a smoke ring or a vortex ring. ring. And let me just remind you what that is. It's a, you imagine uh, an invisible ring in the middle of the air, and then the fluid, the, the smoke or, or, or the air, rotates around that ring uh, in this way, and then the ring comes out of the plane of the board at you. Now, everyone was familiar with this, this effect. Um, back in the 1800s in, in Scotland, they used to do this rather strange thing called uh, smoking tobacco. No one ever does that anymore because they discovered it's bad for you, um, but I'm told it's a little like vaping. Um, one of the great things about giving a talk over Zoom is that you never realize if, any, if no one talks, la laughs at your joke. Um, so I'll assume everyone's laughing and I will go on. But anyway, it's, it's true that everyone was very familiar with the uh, phenomenon of a smoke ring because smokers could produce uh, smoke rings from their mouth and, and then you know, everyone would watch them. Um, what Peter Day Tate had done is he actually built a machine to blow smoke rings and he showed it to his friend, Lord Kelvin. And Lord Kelvin had a number of uh, simultaneous epiphanies. And um, the content of, uh, of the first epiphany um, uh, can be summed up in, in, in something we still teach to undergraduates in fluid dynamics classes. It's known as the circulation theorem, uh, or it's essentially equivalent to the circulation theorem. Um, 
Calvin's circulation theorem. And the content of that, um, of that, of that theorem is the following statement. If it were not for um, the friction in the air, the fact that, that air has viscosity and, and dissipation, then this smoke ring configuration would, um, with the, you know, the flowing of the, of the smoke around this central uh, loop, would just continue forever. It would just keep, the air would just keep going around and around and around and around, and the smoke ring would never dissipate. And the only reason the smoke ring does dissipate is because air is not a perfect fluid, and it's friction. And that got Calvin thinking, well, where can you find a, a fluid that doesn't have any friction at all? Now, such fluids do exist. We, we call them superfluids. For example, if you take helium and you cool it down to one degree Kelvin at standard pressure, it becomes superfluid. And if you start a vortex ring uh, flowing in, in a superfluid helium, it really does last essentially forever without, uh, without dissipating. But uh, unfortunately, you know, Kelvin didn't have any cryogenic apparatus. Uh, to cool things down. And furthermore, helium actually hadn't even been discovered in, in 1867. So he didn't know about, about uh, superfluid helium. However, there was something he thought he knew about, which was supposedly a perfect dissipationless fluid. And it's a famous mistake in the scientific literature. The mistake is known as ether. And the, uh, the idea of ether is was supposedly a perfect dissipationless fluid that filled all of, all of space. Um, and its purpose was to uh, carry electromagnetic waves. Now, why did they believe in, um, in, in this ether stuff, which we now know doesn't exist? Um, well, they knew a lot about waves. And when they saw a wave uh, on the water, they knew what they were actually seeing was, was water sl sloshing back and forth. And they knew you know, when they heard a wave of sound in the air, they knew that what they were actually hearing was air being pushed back and forth. And they knew that light was a wave or it had wave-like properties. Um, and they assumed that there must be something being pushed back and forth to carry that wave uh, of light. And they also knew that um, you can see light from stars very, very, very far away. And so this fluid must have no friction at all because if it had any friction, the light wouldn't be able to, the wave wouldn't it won't be able to make it to us without, without dissipating. Now the idea of, of ether as this fluid that carries, that carries light actually predates Kelvin by several hundred years. It goes back to the French philosopher, René Descartes. He, he just thought this stuff up. He said, I think therefore it is. And he, he created ether out of, out of nothing. In case you didn't catch that, that was a joke about the philosopher Descartes, you know, I think that, anyway, I don't have to explain the joke. I hope you get the joke. Um, don't worry if you didn't get it. Uh, again, I will assume everyone's laughing. And, and go on. Anyway, it is the idea of ether is in fact due to Rene Descartes. And by the 1800s, pretty much everyone in the scientific community um, believed entirely in, um, in the idea of ether. So on the one hand, Kelvin uh, had his uh, circulation theorem, which tells him that if you have a fluid which has no friction, then these sort of vortex rings here, smoke rings will last forever. And on the other hand, he believed in this ether stuff, um, which was supposedly a perfect dissipationless fluid. So that got him thinking, well, well, what then is a smoke ring in the ether? And he came to a really remarkable conclusion. He said, a smoke ring in the ether is an atom. Like maybe um, this could be uh, a hydrogen atom. And then maybe you could have something a little more complicated like uh, two linked rings where you have a ring like this and, and a ring like this and the fluid flows around one linked ring like this, and the fluid flows around another linked ring like, like this. And maybe this is something more complicated like uh, a hydrogen molecule. And by uh, Kelvin circulation theorem, because this is a, these are, this is a flow in a um, perfectly dissipation of fluid, this flow configuration should last forever. And then you can have something even more complicated. See if I can draw this without making a mistake. Um, you could have something that looks kind of like this and, and kind of like this and, and then kind of like this. That's a, a knot known as a trefoil knot. And then the fluid would flow around it this way and the fluid would flow around it this way, and this way and so forth and so on and so forth and so on like this. And that fluid flow configuration maybe would be a more complicated atom, something like maybe, maybe lithium. Now, this idea, what became known as, as Kelvin or Thompson's uh, vortex theory, uh, of the atom 
uh, sounds completely bonkers to us right now because we know, well, first of all, we know that ether doesn't even exist and we know what atoms are made of, protons, neutrons, and, and electrons, and it has nothing to do with, with uh, fluid flow in, 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 the, in, in the ether. But back in the, in the 1860s and 1870s, it actually sounded like a really good idea for, for several reasons because it gave them uh, a picture of what an atom might look like and gives you an idea or at least a cartoon of why it is that um, uh, uh, atoms are discrete and, and immutable. Now, right from the beginning, there were some people who were rather critical of the vortex theory of the atom, and one of them was Peter Tate. And, and Peter Tate said, well, it's a nice picture, it's a nice cartoon, but it doesn't predict anything. It doesn't predict um, the, the masses of the atoms, the electrical properties, the chemical properties, the optical properties, pretty much anything that you would want it to predict, this theory doesn't exist, it doesn't predict. So it's not really a, um, it's not really a good theory. Um, nonetheless, a lot of very serious scientists besides Kelvin, people like Maxwell, Helmholtz, Kirchhoff, took this theory very, very seriously and worked on it for a number of years, trying to extract uh, real predictions from the vortex theory of the atom. And then after about 10 years, they, they more or less gave up because obviously this isn't right and it didn't predict anything useful. Um, during those 10 years, Peter Tate was more or less ignoring the whole situation. He was off golfing. He was a, he was a fantastic sportsman. Um, and um, actually, if, if anyone, I'm told there's 500 people in the audience, send a, question, send a, send a note through the chat or the Q&A. If you're familiar with the name Freddie Tate, who is a champion of the British Open, that's his son, Peter Tate. He's taught his son to play golf. Um, and, and Freddie became a, a great champion. Um, but Peter Tate himself was a great golf player, a great rugby player. He was doing all sorts of sports as well as being a scientist. He's a very impressive, impressive guy. And he was ignoring the vortex theory of the atom. Um, at the end of these 10 years, more or less, most of the scientific community had given up on the vortex theory of the atom for the reasons that Peter Tate had, had expressed uh, 10 years earlier, that it just didn't predict anything. But Peter Tate came back and looked at it again. And he said, well, it doesn't seem to predict anything useful, but it's very pretty. And sometimes a theory that's pretty enough may have some truth in it. And so he decided what he really needed to do was build a periodic table of all possible knots. This is the simplest knot. This is the next simplest knot. This is the next simplest knot and so forth and so on. And he felt that if he could make a periodic table of all possible knots, he would um, know something more about the periodic table of, of the elements. He thought that that was the stumbling block that we didn't know enough about knots. And if he could learn more about knots, he would know more about the elements. So he set on this project, which occupied much of the remainder of his life. And he became what we view now as, as the father of the scientific field, the mathematical field of studying knots, what we call knot theory, uh, which is a very beautiful and rich and important field uh, of mathematics, topology, and also of, of physics. Now, um, uh, when as he was doing this, he hit on some of the most important questions of knot theory, which I'll explain to you in, in a moment. Uh, and I eventually will come back to physics, I promise. Um, uh, but before leaving, leaving the Peter Tate story, uh, I should tell you the, the end of Peter Tate, because he comes to a rather sad end. It gets to be around 1900, and he spent much of, of the remainder of his life working on the vortex theory of the atom, building his table of the knots, his, what's known as the Tate table of the knots. He learned an enormous amount about, about knots. Uh, in fact, he was way, way ahead of his time. Some of his conjectures about uh, the topology of knots were not proved till after the year 2000. Um, and, um, and he really launched this entire branch of, of, uh, of mathematics. But around 1900, he starts to get rather depressed about the situation because despite having learned so much about, about knots, he hasn't learned anything more about the periodic table of, of the elements. And he writes some letters to, to his friend, Lord Kelvin, uh, saying that, that he feels like he's wasted so much of his scientific career working on this, this theory that obviously wasn't going anywhere. Um, then the, the following year, 19, 1901, his, his son, Freddie, the, the champion golfer, was, was killed in the Boer Wars in, in South Africa. And that sent uh, um, uh, Peter Tate into a terrible depression, which he never recovered from, and he died 
only a few months uh, later of, of depression. Depressed, obviously, at the at the loss of his of his champion son, but also having feel like feel having, feeling like he had wasted so much of his, his scientific career at the same time. So uh, that's the rather sad and tragic end of a, of a very great scientist. So what was it that Peter Tate put his finger on that was uh, so important? Well, the fundamental question in the theory of knots is how do you distinguish one knot from another? So let me draw two knots. This is a very simple knot, just a simple loop. It's sometimes called the unknot, uh, uh, a loop without any complication in it. Um, and you know, we wanna know, is this really the same knot as something that looks like this? So I'll make this thing look like a, a sort of a figure eight, like this. Um, when I say, is it the same knot or is it a different knot? The question is, could you take this picture over here and, and distort it um, without using scissors, without cutting it, to turn it in, into this? You can stretch it, you can pull it, you can you know, um, unfold it any way you like. And can you turn it into this picture here? If you can, then we say these are topologically equivalent pictures. We say that they're the same knot on Peter Tate's periodic table. And if you can't distort one into the other without, without cutting, then we say that they are uh, topologically different knots. Um, now this looks like a pretty easy uh, thing to answer. We're fairly smart people and we can see that if we just take this strand here and slide it over here and this strand underneath and slide it over here, we will uh, open this uh, little figure eight thing into uh, a simple loop. And we will have turned this knot into, into this knot without using scissors. So we, we discover that in fact, these are topologically equivalent knots. However, it rapidly becomes extremely difficult to tell when two knots are the same when they're not, when they're more complicated. For example, uh, this knot here, known as the, the trefoil knot, um, it was not until the mid-1920s that someone managed to show that there's uh, two trefoil knots, uh, this one and its mirror image, and they cannot be deformed into each other without, um, without cutting. Um, so, so that's sort of... Um, uh, you know, and then it gets much, much more complicated as you have much more, more complicated, complicated knots. So what, what Peter Tate realized is that you need a mathematical tool to help you distinguish knots from each other. And, and in modern language, the, the tool we use is what's known as a knot invariant. Knot invariant. And a knot invariant is a mapping from a knot or, or a picture of a knot drawn on a piece of paper to an output. And the output could be a, a number, or it could be a polynomial or a color or an element of a group. It doesn't matter so much what the output is. What's important is what goes on in the mapping. The mapping occurs via a set of rules and the rules are cooked up in such a way that topologically equivalent knots have to give the same output. Let me repeat that again. Topologically equivalent knots have to give the same output. So if you have two knots and they're really complicated, you don't know uh, what they are, you can take them, you stick them into your set of rules. If you get two different outputs, you know immediately that um, these knots cannot be deformed into each other without cutting in any way, okay? So you can imagine how this is a useful thing to have if you're interested in, um, in building a, a periodic table of the knots. So in order to show you how these knot invariant things work, I'm going to define a, a knot invariant known as uh, the Kaufman sometimes known as the Kaufman bracket, Kaufman invariant bracket. Um, that's uh, for historical reasons. And it was invent, you know, it's named after its inventor. Its inventor was Vaughn Jones. Uh, that was a joke. It was obviously not named after his inventor, its inventor, uh, Vaughn Jones. So Vaughn Jones um, was a, he, uh, a, a very famous mathematician. He won the Fields Medal. It's like the, the Nobel Prize of, of Mathematics. He just passed away actually a few months uh, ago, uh, Louis Kaufman, whom the, the, uh, this knot invariant is named after, is also a very good mathematician who's very much, much alive. And what uh, uh, Kaufman did, which got his name attached to this, is he managed to simplify what Von Jones was doing into such a form that um, I can explain it to you in really just a few lines, which I'm about to do right now. Okay. So in order to define the, the Kaufman invariant. The first thing you need to do is you need to pick a number. We'll call it A. A stands for a number. Uh, that's why we call it A. 
for now, we'll leave it as just a, as a variable, but um, we might give it an act, uh, a value later on, some complex number. And then we have some simple rules for evaluating the Kaufman bracket invariant of, of, of a knot. So the first rule is a simple rule. It's if you have a loop of string and there's nothing going through the loop of string or over or under the loop of string, you can replace this loop of string with the following combination, minus a squared, minus a to the minus two. And that combination of, of variables occurs so frequently, we give it its own name, we call it D. So the, so the first rule is really simple. A simple loop of string without anything going through it or over it or under it is worth the value D, okay? The second rule is, um, and all we need is two rules. The second rule is, is a little bit more complicated. It goes like this. If we have two strands, we have a picture with two strands crossing over each other like this, we can replace that picture with a sum of two pictures. So the first picture, we take the two strings and we make them go vertically. And in the second picture, we take the two strings and we make them go horizontally. And in fact, we give these pictures coefficients. The first uh, picture gets a coefficient A and the second picture gets a coefficient A inverse. So what am I doing here? What I'm doing here is I'm doing some sort of algebra with pictures. I took a picture and I made it into a sum of two pictures and the pictures get uh, coefficients out, out front. And if, if this isn't clear, I'm gonna do an example of it in a moment that will um, hopefully clarify. Um, so those are the only two rules we need, um, but it's convenient to cheat a little bit and uh, draw the second rule again. Um, and I'm gonna draw uh, the second rule again. And the only thing I'm gonna change is I'm gonna rotate all the pictures by 90 degrees. A like this plus A inverse. So I leave the coefficients the same, but the pictures are rotated by 90 degrees. So it's really the same rule. You're just looking at all the pictures uh, from a different angle. Um, and it's convenient to do this because it's a lot easier to draw the rule twice here and here, um, rather than to ask you to rotate your head at a, a later moment, okay? All right, so to show you how this uh, Kaufman bracket invariant works, I'm going to evaluate um, the Kaufman bracket of a very simple knot. It's one we've already discussed. Um, this knot here, this sort of figure eight looking thing. Um, okay, so how do we evaluate this? Well, the first thing we do is we look here at this crossing, this upper crossing here. And we see that within that little red loop, um, there's a crossing like that. And that's exactly like this crossing here. So we can replace that loop with A times vertical plus A inverse times horizontal. So I've just um, really acted only within that little loop and replaced it by this and this. It is, hopefully that's clear. It's because if you understand this, you will understand everything that follows. This is the most important moment of the talk. This is the most important moment of, of the day, most important moment of the week. Most important, it's not the most important moment of your life, but, but it's, it's important. Okay, so if you understand this, you'll be okay. Um, so the, then what we do is we only replaced um, things within, within this, uh, sorry, within this upper loop here, only within that loop. And then we fill in everything else exactly as it is on the left, unchanged. So it looks like this, completely unchanged. Like this, completely unchanged. Okay. All right. So now I have applied this upper rule uh, once. Now I have a sum of two diagrams. And in each of these diagrams, I have a crossing here. And that crossing looks like this crossing here. So I can apply the lower rule. And to do that, I'm actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this A down here. Then I'm going to open up a bracket, and then I have uh, I'm going to apply this lower rule here. So we get a times horizontal plus a inverse times vertical, and then the rest of this knot gets uh, completely translated without change uh, down to here. So kind of like this, like that, like this. Didn't make any mistakes, uh, and then I'm going to take this. A inverse, bring it down here, open up another bracket, inverse, open up another bracket. And then again, I have to act on this crossing with the lower rule. 
So we have this, and then A inverse, like this, and then we fill in the rest of the knot completely unchanged. This, this, and like this. Okay, so now you'll notice that I've, um, I've gotten rid of all the crossings in, in the, these diagrams. And so now the only thing I'm left with is, is loops. Everything that's left is just loops and each loop is worth the value D. So let's replace each loop by the value D. So I get uh, A squared times this guy gives me two loops. So that's D squared. Then A cancels A inverse, and I get, have one loop here, so that's just D, because the A is canceled. Then the A is canceled here as well, but I have three loops, so that's D cubed. And then finally, over here, I have A to the minus two from here and here, and there's, uh, so A to the minus two times D squared, two loops, okay? And then we need one more, more thing. I'm going to cut this and paste it, copy and paste. We need this piece of information. Oops, there we go. Okay, we'll put it over here. We need that D is equal to minus A squared minus A to the minus two. And looking at that, staring at it for a second, we realize that means we can take this term and this term and put them together and combine them together to give minus D cubed because, um, well, the A squared and the A to the minus two give you minus D here and then there's d squared left over. So I get minus d cubed. This minus d cubed cancels this d cubed. And at the end of the day, the calculation is finished. We just get the only thing left over is d. Yay. Okay, that's the end of the calculation. And why does that get a yay? The really reason that gets a yay is because at the beginning of the calculation, um, way up here, we had this funny looking knot, but secretly we knew that this knot was nothing more than uh, just a simple, a simple ring, the unknot, um, just a simple loop. Um, but it looked more complicated. We made it, we folded it over to make it look more complicated. Then we evaluated this Kaufman bracket invariant. And at the end of the day, it gave us D. The Kaufman bracket invariant of a simple loop is D. And no matter how many times we fold it over and try to make it look more complicated, it's still going to necessarily give us D as an output, we could have folded it over a hundred times or a thousand times, and we still would have gotten D uh, for an output, no matter how complicated we try to make it. We try to make it look okay, um, and that's uh, how these knot invariant things work. It doesn't matter how complicated you make the the you try to make the lot look, you're still going to get the same output. Okay, um, now if you think about it, you might say, well, this sounds like it's a really useful thing to have uh, in your arsenal of tricks if you're trying to um, uh, build a periodic table uh, of knots. But then you think about it a little bit longer and you realize that uh, actually maybe for complicated knots, it's not that useful after all. Why not? Well, in this knot up here, we had two crossings, this one here and this one here. And we ended up with four diagrams. If we had had three crossings, we would have ended up with eight diagrams. Four crossings, we would have 16 diagrams, five crossings, 32 diagrams, and so forth and so on. The number of diagrams, number of diagrams uh, is equal to two to the number of crossings. And it grows exponentially. And we all know about exponentials. Exponentials always end in, in, in great sadness and misery in one way or the other. Um, and in fact, that's exactly what's going to happen here. If we try to evaluate the, the Kaufman um, bracket invariant of a complicated knot with a lot of crossings, it's going to be too difficult to do because we're going to end up with way too many diagrams. It's, it's really, really easy to draw a picture of a, of a knot which has, which has 100 crossings. And the number 2 to the 100th power is so enormous that uh, if you set um, the world's biggest computer um, trying to calculate the Kaufman invariant of, of this knot for a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, it still would not have come to an answer. So you might say, well, okay, for really complicated knots, maybe uh, this Kaufman bracket invariant isn't that useful after all. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Okay, so after that long um, introduction about, um, um, about knots, let me now switch gears to something that sounds like it's very different, but actually extremely similar. 
the idea of a topological quantum field theory, topological quantum field theory, field theory, which is also basically the same thing as topologically ordered matter. There's a slight difference in the definition in the sense that a quantum field theory is something that you write down on paper and topologically ordered matter is something you have in the lab, but hopefully the field theory is something that describes, correctly describes your, your topologically ordered matter in, um, in the laboratory. Um, so the, or at least at long distance and uh, long length scales and, and, and low energy scales. So that, that probably, if, if you don't already know what a topological quantum field theory or topological order matter is, neither of those two definitions are all that, all that useful. So let me try to give them a, uh, a more useful definition. So a more useful definition is a topological quantum field theory, which we sometimes call the TQFT, is equal to a physical system, uh, physical system, or described a physical system, um, describes where amplitudes depend on geometry, sorry, depend on topology, topology, not geometry. Okay, since this is a, an important statement, I'll, I'll repeat it uh, uh, and then I'll give an example. Um, so topologically ordered matter is a physical system where amplitudes depend on topology, not geometry. So what on earth do I, do I mean by this? Let me, let me try to give a, uh, a picture. Um, okay. Um, so I should, I should mention that uh, for the rest of the uh, hour uh, I'm, I'm speaking, I'm going to be talking about two-dimensional systems. And actually, I think much of the rest of the week will be de devoted to two-dimensional systems, if not all the rest, rest of the week. Um, so I'll draw my two-dimensional system here. Here's a two-dimensional system, a, a, a disk like that. And I will draw time going upward on the page. You know that time goes upwards because, because time is money and money always goes upwards or something, something like that. Um, okay, so let's imagine this, this um, two-dimensional system here starts in its, its ground state. The ground state, we, uh, if we have uh, you know, a disk like this, we'll imagine the ground state is, is a, a unique state. We'll imagine there's a gap to any excitations. So it really doesn't have a lot going on. It's just sitting there in its ground state eigenstate, not, not doing anything. However, at some point in time, some you know, slice of time here, um, you know, you, we decide externally outside of the system that we're going to add some energy to the system. So let's add some energy to the system, maybe a, a photon or something like that. And um, that photon can create a particle-antiparticle pair or a particle-hole pair, I guess, since we're condensed matter physicists, we talk about particle-hole. Um, and then maybe at a later time, let's create another, uh, put in another photon and uh, create another particle-antiparticle pair like this, like that. And then maybe let's drag one of these particles around another one of these particles like this. Um, like that to make a knot. And then we bring them back together um, and, oops, and try to bring them back together at the end of the day. Here, make them approach each other at the end of the day. There, bring them back together here and bring them back together here. And we want it. So we're doing an experiment here. We put in the, put in the energy to create the particles and antiparticles. We move the particles around each other and then we brought them back together uh, at the end of the day, and we're going to measure what happens when we bring the particles uh, back together. Um, now, several things can happen when we uh, bring the particles back together, and, and it shouldn't surprise us too much that there's several possible outcomes. Um, one possible outcome is that the particles uh, re-annihilate and emit the, you know, the same photons that we put in. So they can emit the photons back out, um, and you get back to exactly the same the same ground state that you that you started with, but another thing that can have happen is um, they can form bound states that refuse to annihilate. I'll we'll draw the bound state like this, like that as the output. And you don't get back to the ground state, but you, instead you get two 
two bound states that won't reannihilate back to back to the vacuum. Yes. Now, the fact that there is some probability of one thing happening and some probability of another thing happening, that shouldn't bother us too much because we know that in, in quantum mechanics, uh, outputs of experiments are, are probabilistic depending on the, the quantum amplitude of, of, of one thing happening versus another thing happening. You take your amplitudes, you square them, you get probabilities. Um, so that actually um, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't surprise us. Um, what is surprising is that in a, a topological quantum field theory, the probabilities depend only on the topology of the knot. Uh, prob depends only on topology of knot. Uh, the amplitudes depend on, depend on topology of knot. Of knot. So we'll go back and look at our definition again. A physical system where amplitudes depend on topology, not geometry. So the probability or the probability amplitudes depend on the topology of the knot only. So that means I can change my experiment. So let me just change the experiment and uh, make it look like this. So I just changed the details of the knot, but the statement is the probability of the two outcomes, either the particles reannihilating to the vacuum or the particles uh, forming a bound state, that that probability remains unchanged. And I can change another you know, feature of this knot, maybe change this over here. So it looks like this. Uh, as long as I don't change the topology of the knot, the claim is that the probabilities of the outcomes uh, of, the, uh, of the two possible outcomes when you make the measurement at the end of the day up here at this final time, um, that that uh, remains unchanged. So it's actually, it's a little surprising that we can have such things, that we can have quantum mechanical systems where the probabilities of the outcome, the probability amplitudes depend only on the topology and not on, on the geometry, because we're used to the idea that details matter when we do quantum mechanical calculations. We expect that it should matter if you move the, the particles quickly or you move them slowly, if you move them close to each other or you move them far from each other, how fast they move around each other, how close they get to each other. You know, if this particle moves way out here or this particle moves way out here, we might expect those details to make a difference in the outcome of, of the experiment. But I'm telling you, no, in a topological quantum field theory or in topological order matter, those things don't matter. The only thing that matters is the topology of, of the knot that we made here. Now this connection between topological quantum field theories and, and knots um, was made rather famously by Ed Witten in a groundbreaking paper of Witten. I see the Princeton, so I should get his name right. Um, back in, in 89, 19, 1989, for his work on uh, the theory of knots and relating them to topological quantum field theories. Um, it's a rather beautiful paper, I should say, that many, many uh, beautiful things embedded in it, um, that uh, he was awarded the Fields Medal along with, uh, along with Juan Jones, uh, the highest prize of, of, of mathematics. And one thing that he, he did in, in retrospect, this is, um, you know, this is sort of, a, this is an obvious step and, and the rest of it is, is, is the far less obvious step, is that if you have a, uh, a topological, topological quantum field theory where the probabilities of the outcome depend only on the topology of the knot, then it must be the case that the amplitudes themselves or the probabilities themselves, uh, tudes or probability amplitudes are equal not to knot invariants. Why? Well, they satisfy our definition of what a knot invariant is. Uh, the input is some picture of, of knots and the output is something, in this case, a probability that depends only on the topology of the knot and you can deform the knot in any way you like. And as long as you don't change the topology of the knot, you do not change the probabilities or the probability amplitudes. So making a connection there between uh, topological quantum field theories and, and not uh, invariants, okay? Now, one thing that, uh, that Witten did uh, a little bit further than this is, um, with uh, sort of tour de force type calculations, um, he managed to show that some TQFTs, which were known at the time, um, and I'll, I'll give them names, uh, SU2 sub K. So we know what SU2 is. SU2 is a, is a, is a, a Lie group. You, you know it probably for, um, from your exercises with um, spin rotation. Um, K here, this substrip K, this is a, uh, is a coupling constant, coupling constant which needs to be an integer equals integer. Um, for TQFTs or topological quantum field theories, 
which are described by this gauge group, SU2, and this coupling constant, K, the um, probability amplitudes for a given knot, like this one, are given exactly by, um, by the, okay, prob amplitude, probability of all particles annihilating, all particles annihilating, particles annihilate back to vacuum. That was one of the, the outcomes, uh, possible outcomes is the particles both annihilate back to the vacuum. Probability of all particles annihilating back to the vacuum is equal to the Kaufman uh, invariant uh, squared. Okay, the Kaufman invariant itself is the probability amplitude and you square the, the probability amplitude in order to get the probability of all particles uh, annihilating up to some normalization, um, which I, I won't, won't describe, but it's not that complicated a normalization. Um, but you need to, in order to evaluate the Kaufman invariant, you need to pick a value of this, of this uh, constant A, the thing that we called A number, and the correct value to choose is I times e to the I pi over two times K plus two with K being this K here, that's K, being the same as that k integer here. So if you have a TQFT of this type and you move your particles around to form some knot and you want to know the probability of all the particles annihilating back to the vacuum, you simply calculate the Kaufman invariant, you plug in this value of a and you have your answer, okay? So this looks like you know a lot of very beautiful math, um, but why are we interested in it uh, from a physics perspective? Well, rather surprisingly, um, we believe that there are physical systems which actually behave in this way. And in fact, that are described exactly by this SU2 uh, level K topological quantum field theories. So we can sort of make a, make a table of the different possible values uh, of K. Uh, K equals one, for those who know what, what, what this is, SU2 level one is, is essentially iso isomorphic to U1 uh, at some level, a level P. And, and these fit in a class known as, as abelian TQFTs, TQFTs. And um, most of fractional quantum Hall effect fits in, in this category. Now, I'm not going to say much about wh what I mean by this, but, um, but I think you'll hear more about it in, in the next talks um, as you go on. Uh, the K equals two class, there's, uh, this is one of the ones where there's been a lot of, of work recently. There is uh, nu equals five halves fractional quantum Hall effect. Um, fractional quantum Hall effects are described by a so-called filling fraction, um, which is a ratio of, of small integers. So nu equals five halves and, and maybe also nu, nu equals seven halves are kind of unique in that they're described by the K equals two topological quantum field theory, SU2 level level two, but then there's a, a growing list of other things that um, people believe also fit in this class. So more or less, when you hear people talk about Majoranas, um, they fit more or less in this, in this category. Um, and there's been a lot of work on Majoranas in the last couple of years. Um, so any sort of 2D topological superconductors, superconductors fit in this category. Um, so uh, we used to say that strontium ruthenate um, was, was one of these, but I think now there's new data telling us that, that this, this isn't. But by the time we got that new data, then there were new, new candidates. So uranium tellurium two is, is a current favorite. Iron uh, tellurium 0.55, selenium 0.45 um, is, a, is another candidate. And there's, there's a couple of other candidates uh, sitting in that, in that category. There's a K equals three category. And the only one of these that we believe we know of is nu equals 12 fifths, uh, fractional quantum Hall, quantum Hall effect. And then there's a lot of toy models um, that, um, that people have, have played with and, and, and ways that people have tried to engineer these topological quantum field theories in, um, in physical systems. Okay, um, so, um, You'll hear a lot more about fractional quantum Hall effects of, of various types, these, these, these throughout the week, I'm, I'm betting. Okay, so now before going on, um, I should do a little bit of honesty in advertisement because I, I attempt to be um, honesty, um, because I attempt to be an, an honest person. And let me try to, because I, I know what's gonna happen. What's gonna happen is, is having learned about the Kaufman Bracken variant, you're gonna go home, you're gonna try to calculate the Kaufman-Bracken invariant for your favorite knot, 
and you're going to run into some trouble and then you're going to be upset and you're going to say, well, this guy lied to me. So I'm going to try to explain to you why, why I'm not lying to you. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to um, take a little section of a knot with a little curl in it like this. And you know what we mean here is that the, this you know, extends off to the left somewhere and it connects up with itself somehow. I'm not so concerned with what's going on over to the left. We'll leave that un unchanged. I'm just going to try to in, uh, calculate, if I can, the Kaufman invariant of this, of this little curl. So to do that, let me go back and, and um, actually, maybe I, I can cut and paste my rules here. Um, here's my rules. Let me cut and paste them so we can, so we can use them. Copy. Um, so back down here, I apologize for the scrolling. I take our rules, paste. We'll try to make them smaller so we won't take up too much space. Put them up here in the corner. Okay, so um, we're going to replace this crossing here with um, A times uh, uh, vertical and then plus A inverse times horizontal. And then this goes off to the left and then like this, and this goes off to the left and then connects like this, um, like this, okay? And then this, loop here is where the D, and then this loop here just straightens out, this just straightens out, so I end up getting A D plus A inverse times a straight line that goes off to the left like this, and um, this combination A D plus A inverse with just a little bit of algebra is uh, equal to minus A uh, cubed times the straight line that goes off to the left. Now, at this point, you might be a little upset with me. And the reason you might be upset is because you will notice that um, you know, I told you that two things that can be deformed into each other, if they, um, if they can be continuously deformed into each other without cutting, they should have the same uh, Kaufman invariant. But now I've just showed you that uh, this picture and this picture differ in the Kaufman invariant by this factor of minus a cubed. So that looks like I lied to you. Did I lie to you or did I not lie to you? I didn't lie to you. Of course, I didn't lie to you. Um, so the reason I didn't lie to you is because we need to think of these strands as not being infinitely thin, but rather as having a thickness. So let's just thicken this up a little bit, like uh, turning into a ribbon or, or a garden hose like that. And then we straighten it out, pull, pull this tight. And if we do that, you'll realize that what you get looks like this, okay? It will be a self-twisted little, little ribbon like that. And that's not the same as this, which is an untwisted, uh, little ribbon or garden hose. So if you, if you ever tried to straighten a garden hose, you know exactly what I mean by this picture. If you, if you don't, if you haven't experienced this with a garden hose, you probably haven't been taking care of your garden very well. Um, so, um, so this factor uh, of minus a cubed is the factor that accounts for this uh, self twist. And this is something that we should actually expect because we know that in quantum mechanics, if you take a particle and you rotate it around its own axis, uh, you can pick up a quantum mechanical phase associated with the spin of the particle. And if you back all the way up to here, you'll notice that, that this constant A is just a quantum mechanical phase. And so this factor of minus A cubed that we're picking up is, is just a, a quantum mechanical phase associated with this, uh, this self-twisting of the particle. Okay, so now you're, you're prepared to go calculate the Kaufman invariant of, of, of your favorite uh, not at home. Okay, so let me um, uh, move on to, to just discuss uh, one or two more properties. I'm going to go over the E. Howard just a little bit, but not too much. Uh, one or two more properties of uh, topological, topologically ordered matter, topological quantum field theories that are quite useful. So let's imagine that we, we have a, here's again, we have our uh, two dimensional system um, put it down here. Um, and we'll start it in its, again, its vacuum state or its ground state. There's no interesting uh, particles there. And uh, actually let's make, a, yeah, let's create some, some uh, maybe a particle and an antiparticle, and a particle and an antiparticle like this. So we have, we have two particles, two antiparticles, and I'm gonna make copies of this picture because I'm gonna need them later. Copy, uh, paste, um, maybe paste another one up here. Maybe paste another one up here. Uh, like this, and that may, maybe is enough. Um, so, um, so the statement is that um, 
uh, the following interesting statement that in most physical systems, like uh, an, an insulator or with a gap, physical systems with a gap, so an insulator, or a superconductor, for example, um, if I start by telling you I'm going to start in the ground state, and then I'm going to add uh, a particle here, a hole here, a particle here, a hole here. Um, I've actually just told you the wave function. I say start with the ground state wave function, uh, particle creation operator, particle creation operator, hole creation operator, hole creation operator. There's the new wave function. But this is not true for topologically ordered matter. That I claim that there can be two uh, linearly independent um, states. We'll call the first one one, and we'll call the second one two. These are um, uh, linearly independent, uh, possibly orthogonal states, uh, with the possibly not orthogonal, but but linearly independent at any rate. Um, they're not the same, and um, they can both be described by the same local quantities. That you start with the ground state and you add two particles and and two holes. So why are topological quantum field theories like that? Why have I not told you everything you need to know? Well, the reason that uh, I haven't told you everything you need to know is because there's two ways I could have pulled these pairs out of the vacuum, these particle hole pairs out of the vacuum. I could have done it like this, where this particle and this uh, hole and this particle and this hole are connected together, or I could have pulled them out of the vacuum like this, where these two are connected together. And these are topologically distinct, so they can be different wave functions. Now, to prove to you that these are in fact different, um, what I need to do is I need to also look at the, the corresponding bras and the way you get to a, a corresponding bra is you sort of time reverse and you uh, return the particles back to the vacuum in the exact opposite way, like this. So this is the bra associated with one, and this is the bra associated with two, like that, like this. And if I want to take an inner product, uh, I then just make a sandwich. So let's do that. Let's take an inner product uh, one, one here. So to do that, I, I take this. Uh, oops, no, I'm not going to. I would just want to take this, uh, copy this, copy, and put it down here, paste, and then I take this guy and I sort of sandwich it on top of it uh, here. Oops, uh, doesn't want to, doesn't want to go. One more shot. Okay, well it doesn't want to do it, um, so I'll just draw. So I take this this top guy here and I put it over here. So I close it up like this. So one on one, this bra on top of this ket, like this, um, ends up, uh, all I did here was I squeezed these two together to bring it down together and make a sandwich. And then this is equal to two loops like that. And using the Kaufman rules, this is just d squared. I can do the same thing with two on two. Oops, sorry. Um, two on two, two on two. Again, uh, let's see if I can take this guy, uh, copy, paste. Yeah, I can take that. Um, and then if I want to put a two up top, I close it up like this. So I took the, the bra here and I sandwiched it onto the ket here. And that's again, two loops. So this looks kind of like this and that's D squared as well. However, if I want to take uh, the inner product of one on two, so one, two like this, um, we take two on the bottom and we take one on the top. So one on the top looks like this, the bra for one. This looks like this. And that is just a single loop in D. So now what we have is we have the, the inner product of one with one is D squared. The inner product of two with two is D squared. The inner product of one with two is D. So this tells you immediately that one and two are linearly independent with the only exception being if D happens to be unity. Um, if, if, if D is unity, and in fact, that does happen in uh, the K equals one case. So this is sort of the, the least interesting case where most, most of fractional quantum Hall effect lives in this least interesting case. It's the other ones that are more interesting. Um, at least in the cases where D is not equal to one, we have two linearly independent states associated with um, two particles and, and two holes. Now, um, finally, I can get with my last remaining few minutes, I can get back to the um, uh, original, you know, topic of my 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 lecture, which I see, which starts with why should you care? That's part of the what that's part of the um, the title, topologically ordered matter, and why you should care. Um, well, if I had instead of calling these things 
uh, one and two. If I had called them instead zero and one, you immediately would have thought of a qubit, a um, uh, quantum bit for doing quantum computation. And that is indeed why you should care because these things are actually really useful for making, uh, making qubits and doing quantum computation. Now, the reason I didn't call them zero and one was partially to trick you into not realizing it was a qubit, but also it's because they're, they're, while they're linearly independent states, they're typically not orthogonal states. So they're not really gonna make a good zero and one by themselves, but, but the combination of them can be put together to make a zero and one. Um, so the idea of using these sort of qubits for a comp computation is known as topological quantum computation, topological quantum computation. And um, it is usually credited, this idea is usually credited to uh, Alexei Kateyev, um, one of the great geniuses of, of modern physics, and, and Michael Friedman, um, who's another Fields Medal winner, won his Fields Medal for the work on the Poincaré conjecture in the 1980s. And the picture they have in mind is the, the following picture. We take a, our two-dimensional system. Here's our two-dimensional system. And uh, if we want to make a bunch of qubits, remember when we, uh, again, time is going to run vertical, as it has in our other pictures. Um, we pull particle, antiparticle pairs out of the vacuum. And when we had two pairs, we made a single qubit. So if I want to make more qubits, I can uh, create more pairs like that. So there I made uh, four qubits. If I want to do uh, a computation, the way I do it is I just drag the particles around each other to form an appropriate knot. And it's not that hard to figure out what knot you need to do to do uh, which computation. And at the end of the day, you bring them back together and um, bring them back together in pairs. And you, you measure, do they um, form bound states or do they, um, or do they annihilate back, back to the vacuum? Now, there's two things. Uh, I, I promise I won't go over too much. There's two things that I should convince you of before, um, before you sort of agree that this is a good idea. Um, maybe you'll never agree this is a good idea. Um, the first thing that, that I should convince you of is one, you can do comp quantum computation this way. Can you do, uh, do quantum computation? Um, and, and two, should you? Um, you know, why would you want to do quantum computation this way? So let me attack the first question first. Can you do quantum computation this way? Well, one way to do it, to answer that question, is to ask um, with your qubits, you know, can you do rotations of qubits? Can you build a controlled knot gate? Can you do all of the uh, operations on your, on your Hilbert space that you need to do in order to do uh, to do a quantum computation. That's maybe a hard way to go about it, but let me give you an argument that would suggest that you should be able to do quantum computation. If you go back to the beginning of the talk, you'll recall that calculating the Kaufman invariant was something that was computationally extremely difficult for a complicated knot. If I have a knot with 100 crossings and I want to calculate the Kaufman invariant of this, this knot, um, it would take two to the hundred diagrams and the biggest computer working for a thousand years would still never be able to come up with an answer. But suppose I uh, had a bunch of these, these particles in, in my laboratory. I had a topological quantum field theory in, in my laboratory, which is described by a certain uh, Kaufman invariant, a certain TPFT. I could actually measure the Kaufman invariant by dragging the particles around each other to form whatever knot I'm interested in and then make the measurement. Recall that the probability of all the particles reannihilating is given by uh, the Kaufman invariant squared. So at least I can make a measurement of the Kaufman invariant squared, which is, or at least an estimate of it by doing the computation uh, many times and, um, and, uh, and measuring the probability that the number of times out of 100 that, it, um, that, that everything annihilates back to the vacuum. Um, so that's um, uh, sort of suggest to you that the, this topological quantum field theory has computational powers which are greater than uh, a uh, conventional computer has. So, uh, so the answer to the first is yes. Uh, in many cases, you can do quantum computation. Um, and the second question is, is, should you? Should you do quantum computation this way? Um, you know, everyone has probably seen all those exciting results from, from Google and IBM and, and, uh, and other companies and, and, and lots of laboratories around the world uh, where they have you know, 10, 20 qubits doing lots of interesting things. 
um, why is it that you would try to do it this way, which looks like it's really inconvenient. And to be honest, no one has ever built, built a qubit out of topologically ordered matter yet. Um, the reason why people might be interested in doing it this way is, is the following. Um, the thing that makes quantum computation hard is its resistance or its non-resistance to, to noise and, uh, and coupling to the environment. So you imagine that some noise comes into the system and tries to influence the, the computation. Now, in a regular uh, quantum computer, which you might think is a, of a, as a bunch of spins in your, you know, that you're holding in traps or something like that, if a photon comes in and flips over a spin, it created an error. And you have to go to great lengths to somehow protect your system from such, such errors. However, in this topological quantum com computer, what happens if noise shows up? Well, if noise shows up, um, this nice smooth path gets converted into a really wiggly path. But as long as you didn't change the topology of the knot, you haven't made any errors at all. So these topological quantum computers have uh, an intrinsic resilience or a robustness against noise. As long as the noise isn't great enough to change the topology of the knot, it doesn't make any errors at all. So that's why people are interested in making um, uh, quantum computers uh, in, this, in this way. So I think maybe I should uh, potentially stop there. Um, but actually, I, I was told that I can go over as much as I want because we don't have the next talk for another hour. So let me, let me just cheat for a second and go just a tiny bit over. Um, that I can probably go on another 45 minutes. Um, that, let me say just a couple words about fractional quantum Hall effect, um, which I guess is the, the subject of much of the remain, remainder of the week. Um, a really simplified picture of fractional quantum Hall effect, because fractional quantum Hall effect is, is where we sort of have the best evidence of uh, topologically ordered order matter. Um, so fractional quantum Hall effect, in very simplified, is two-dimensional electrons in a magnetic field, and then you cool down, cool down to low temperature, um, and out comes fractional quantum Hall effect, and each fractional quantum Hall effect is, is indexed by a, a filling fraction, which is a density of electrons, um, the flux quantum, that's a bunch of fundamental constants divided by the magnetic field. Um, and for each of these fractional quantum Hall effects, the, the claim is that you have a different type of, of topologically ordered matter. And, and why would you think that? Well, it's, it's actually quite, I mean, fractional quantum Hall effect, as you probably all know, and probably will hear a lot more of this week, is, is pretty tough to work with because it's very low temperature. The systems are, are, are finicky. There's lots of um, problems in, in, in you know, measuring them without heating them up and so forth. Um, there aren't a lot of experiments you can do um, easily. The only experiment that you can really do easily is just measure the conductance of the, of the material. So let's imagine we have a two-dimensional system of some random shape. We um, run a current through the system here, and we measure a voltage on the system here. If we do it with this topology, uh, this is what we call the longitudinal voltage. It comes out exactly zero. This is just like we would get in a superconductor. We get zero um, voltage across the, across the superconductor. But there is one other experiment that we can do easily, which is to cross the leads of our um, measurement like this. This jumps over like this. So now we have a, a Hall voltage measurement. And instead, we get h over e squared 1 over, well, the filling fraction. The filling fraction is always p over q, some ratio of small integers. Uh, times the current flowed. So this is the, the, Hall, uh, the Hall resistance, and it's quantized to one part in, in well, in, in you know, very cold samples, and clean samples. This is quantized to one part in 10 to the 10 or something like that. That's like measuring the distance between Oxford and, and Princeton to within uh, uh, better than a centimeter. Um, it's rather remarkable that you can get such results out of an experiment where you don't even know the shape of the sample. You don't know the size of the sample. You don't even know where you put these contacts. The only thing you put the contacts on with just big blobs of solder. The only thing that you know is you crossed the uh, the leads to measure the Hall Hall voltage. Now, um, the fact that the um, this is a hint. The fact that it doesn't the the shape of the sample doesn't matter is a hint that you have something topological going on. And you compare this to like measuring the conductance of a chunk of of 
of copper or a chunk of aluminum, when you measure the, the conductance of a, of a chunk of, of, of copper, it matters entirely where you put the contact, uh, what voltage you get, get out. So this is kind of an interesting effect. So the last thing I wanna, wanna say, and then I promise I'll stop, is that the, um, the fact that there's zero longitudinal voltage tells us this is dissipationless. There's no loss in these systems. And as a result, you can imagine the uh, vortices in these systems being uh, persistent objects. They, they keep flowing forever. Um, these are the charged quasi-particles in, in fractional quantum Hall effect. And these charged quasi-particles in fractional quantum Hall effect, you can think of these things as vortices. These are the things that we want to braid around each other to form knots. And if you think back to what it was that Kelvin was thinking about at the beginning of, of the talk, it was actually not so dissimilar. He was thinking about uh, vortices in a dissipationless medium uh, the ether in three dimensions. And here we have vortices in a dissipationless medium, this fractional quantum Hall fluid. The only thing that's different is now we have two plus one dimensions with one dimension being time here as compared to three spatial dimensions. So it's uh, not so dissimilar to what uh, Kelvin was thinking about 150 years ago, but of course it's, it's completely different. So I guess I will um, end my talk there and I'll uh, answer uh, whatever questions we have. Hello. Thank you very much for that oh, great talk, welcome. Mr. Simon. You're welcome. All right. So we have some questions here. Um, I'll start with the first question. Uh, so somebody asked, why do loops contribute to the Kaufman invariant in a multiplicative fashion, d to the two, as opposed to additively yeah. two times Let's d, go back up to whereas the, the knot crossings up. are decomposed additively? Yeah. It's just the definition of how we're going to um, define our knot invariant um, that uh, loops multiply and the, the, uh, the rules are that you put a plus sign here and we have two separate things which are um, written next to each other, you multiply them. Um, I re realize that this is, seems like a sort of arbitrary rule, but the rule has been cook cooked up such that you have uh, a knot invariant. If you try, you could try making a knot invariant using a, another set of rules and um, you know, it's not so easy to come up with a set of rules that will give you a knot invariant. Um, I, I don't believe that it will work. If you, if you simply just change the rule, I, I don't believe you would have a knot invariant anymore. Um, as, as the, uh, but you might be able to find knot invariants with other sets of rules as well. In fact, I, we know that there are other knot invariants corresponding to other topological quantum field theories from other uh, sets of rules, and in fact, not invariants that don't even correspond to topological uh, quantum field theories exist as well. The key here is that we've constructed the set of rules such that we have a, a not invariant, meaning that, that the output only depends on the topology of, of what we input. Great. Our second question, um, how do these Feynman diagrams make sense when we interpret them as in, uh, in real space, where the virtual particles form knots? Um, right. Um, so in this case, I haven't, these things actually aren't Feynman diagrams that I've drawn. Um, I think there is a limit in which you can make these di So this is not a Feynman, I mean, I should, I should, I should have had a warning sign. This is not a Feynman diagram. Um, uh, this is a, a, a space-time diagram of what happened. Um, I think there, I believe there is a limit in which you can view these things as, as Feynman diagrams, but, but you don't have to be in that limit. Um, this is what I've drawn here is a space-time diagram of, of, what, of what physically happened. Great. Um, our third most popular question is, will these lecture notes be made available online? Or perhaps do you have another recommendation for a place to um, read about similar topics? Yeah. So. Um, if, if you want this story in a nicely, nicely written version, I have a proto book on my website. So if you go to my website homepage, um, there is a proto book um, describing this and then, you know, 35 more. So this is the first chapter, which is what you just heard is the first is chapter one, uh, more or less. Um, or maybe it's chapter two, one and two, chapters one and two. Um, 
And uh, it's not a finished book, but the first couple of chapters are pretty finished. So you can start reading from there. And then when you get to chapter like 25 and the whole thing falls apart, well, I apologize, I'm not done yet. Um, but um, if any, and I will tell everyone here that if you want the most finished version of the book, don't click where it says proto book, click where it says topological, topological course, topological quantum course from 2020, from the most recent year, which I guess was like taught it last fall, click there instead. That has an even more recent version of, of the book and more chapters are finished and you can look at those. Um, my editor doesn't want me to make too public the, um, the book before it's actually gets published. Um, so I kind of make it okay by hiding the, the uh, or send me email, I'll, show, I'll tell you where to look. I sort of hide the, the, the more finished version and, and he, as long as he doesn't notice, then, then it's okay that people can read it. Um, you have to buy the book later. My editor will get mad if, if, I, if I didn't say that as well. Um, okay, other questions? Thank you. Uh, yeah, the next question, um, somebody asks, is there, a method determine to, is there a method to determine when a theory is topological? Um, well, you could try doing experiments like this and, um, you know, seeing whether the outcome depends on the topology, uh, on the geometry or just on the topology. And if it depends just on the topology, then you have an idea that is topological. Um, now that's not a very good answer. I, and if I can slightly rephrase the question, suppose someone hands you a, 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 a theory, um, and says, is this a topological quantum field theory? Is the lower, and that's a really complicated question to answer. If someone had handed you the Hamiltonian for you know, electrons in a magnetic field, so you'll be, I, hopefully you'll be seeing, um, you know, someone handed you the Hamiltonian for two dimensional electrons interacting with each other in a magnetic field. Um, suppose someone handed you this in, in 1970 and didn't have the, the experience of having experiments that showed you the fractional quantum Hall effect existed, um, would you even be able to guess what the ground state was? Well, no, no one guessed. No one guessed until there was an experiment and then Bob Laughlin came along and, and um, guessed the Laughlin wave function and then lots of more work was done. Um, so it's not an easy process to start with a Hamiltonian and guess what the ground state is. In the modern era, we do have the advantage that we have a lot of very good numerical methods that if someone hands you, you know, someone walks on up off the street and says, here, I have my Hamiltonian, tell me if it has a topological ground state. Um, you can try um, some numerical techniques and there are certain things you can do that uh, in numerical techniques that will tell you whether you have uh, topological properties of the physical system. One thing, for example, is if you have, if you take your physical system on a torus like this, and you discover that there is a ground state degeneracy, ground state degeneracy, uh, degen, that is often, that is required, that is a property which is required of, a, of topological, topologically ordered matter of topological quantum field theories. Um, it is not necessarily true that it's the only way to get a ground state degeneracy, but it is a way to get a ground state degeneracy. Um, and once you um, think you might have a topological, topological quantum field theory, so you can try to try to determine that numerically in a small system, do I have a ground state degeneracy? Um, and then once uh, you discover that you, you do, you can test a number of other things, like you can cut the system and look at um, uh, the, uh, the entanglement entropy, for example, entanglement entropy, which also shows um, signatures of entropy uh, of, of being a topological quantum field theory. So there are fair, there's a fair number of, of numerical tests that you can do on, on a system that can give you a, a, a sign whether you have a topological system or, or not. Um, if you have a physical system in your laboratory, it's, it's I think, much, it's a much harder game. And, um, I think what people mostly do is they try to come up with a microscopic Hamiltonian, which, repre which correctly represents 
the physics of your of your system. And then when you trust the microscopic Hamiltonian, you study the microscopic Hamiltonian um, in, in you know, these, these types of ways. Great, thank you very much. That was a very helpful answer. Um, do you have time for more questions or? Yeah, I can keep going probably another uh, 20 minutes or so if, okay. if you wanna keep going, yeah. Uh, so there's there's still more in the Q and A thing. Okay, keep going. So, here, somebody asked, "What does a particle hole trajectory crossing in your diagram of the ground state evolution um, in time upon excitation mean?" And they're saying it's before you introduce SU two. Uh, okay. What does uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. What does the before yeah. I introduce SU two? What does a particle hole trajectory crossing in your diagram on ground state evolution in time? So, so I guess it's this question, this picture here. What do I mean by this? So um, time is going vertical. So I, I guess this diagram, if I drew this diagram in real space, what it would be is I would be creating a particle hole pair and another particle hole pair. I guess I do this, this one happens earlier. So I create a particle hole pair here. And then at some time later, I have a particle hole pair here. And then I pull the pairs apart from each other. And then I take one of them and I drag it around the other. And then I bring them back together um, to the same point and I reannihilate them. So let me, let me try to draw exactly the same picture down here. Um, see if I can do it in, in uh, okay. So I start, um, start in the vacuum. Then I put in some energy to create a particle antiparticle pair. And then I put in some energy over here to create a particle antiparticle pair. And then I pull these things apart from each other, drag them apart from each other. So I'm going to move this and I'm going to drag this, um, move this guy out as well like this. And I'm going to drag them around each other. Keep going. This guy goes around here. This guy goes around here. This guy, did I, did I, make, did I make it around? Goes around here. This guy comes back here. And then at a later time, we try to bring them back together to reannihilate. Did I do that correctly? <laughs> um, uh, the point was I wanted to take one of them all the way around the other and bring it back to uh, where he where he started. Um, that's that's what I, I meant by that picture. These are not virtual particles. These are real particles. You put actually put in maybe this would would clarify. You actually put in energy. So these are not virtual particles. These are real particles. Great. Yeah. Um, somebody asked. When should we use topological quantum field theories versus usual quantum field theories? And is there any is any possibilities that the description of topological quantum field theory and regular quantum field theory coexist? Yeah. So a topological quantum field theory is, is you, you can think of it as a fairly simplified form of, of, of field theory in, in the sense that it, it doesn't end up caring uh, about um, uh, lots of details. It only depends on, on, on topology in the end. Now, it um, can they coexist? Yeah, there are cases when, in which they can coexist. So for example, you can have regular quantum field theories um, with terms in them that make them become topological at long, long length scales. So if you look at short wavelength or short length scale phenomenon, you need to use uh, a, a real field theory um, which has a topological term in it um, in order to find out what happens. But then if you sort of zoom out and look at very, very long length scales, uh, keep all the particles very far from each other, then all of the other um, terms in the, in the quantum field theory, they scale away to nothing. And the only thing that's left is the topological quantum field theory. So you, you can, um, but so you can certainly have situations where you have uh, quantum field theories and topological quantum field theories sort of coexisting, the, the, you know, the, the topological quantum field theory being the only thing that, that survives at long length scale. It's also possible that you have a physical system where the um, where you have both the topological quantum field theory and a, a regular quantum field theory in two different so-called sectors that don't really speak to each other uh, in the sense that there will be a topological part of the uh, of the of the Hilbert space and a non-topological part uh, of the Hilbert space, and so the you know the properties of the topological part part of the Hilbert space are only uh, influenced by by topology about whether things get dragged around each other or not, and then there'll be a non-topological part of the Hilbert space 
which um, uh, is influenced by by you know details. Um, so that that can happen as well. Great, thank you. Um, maybe just one more then. Uh, okay. Somebody asked, I think it, about earlier on when you're talking about knot theory, are we are we restricted to 2D within the knot theory? It seems that an eight shape would be different than zero, but in 3D you could rot the, rotate the upper half of the eight without uh, cuts to get zero. Yeah, so, okay. Um, let me say, say a couple things here. Um, in, in, Okay, in, 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 so what I was doing was I was doing two plus one D. So I drew a knot, you know, something like this. So in, in that picture, I, I assume that this thing is equivalent to, to, you know, to this, because you can just in the, in the, in the full three dimensions, you can, you can untwist, but you can ask, well, what about three plus one D? And in three plus one D, the story is, is, is somewhat different. I mean, you do have topological quantum field theories in three plus one D as well. But one thing that you'll realize uh, immediately is that in three plus one D, um, you can't um, make an, uh, let's make a, a simple knot in in so something that's knotted in two plus one D is like this trefoil. Let's uh, let's do this. So in two plus one D, this thing is fundamentally knotted. There's no way that this thing is definitely not equal to this. You can't undo that knot without scissors. But in three plus one D, three plus one D, these things are the same. Um, that you can continuously deform this thing into this thing in three plus one D without um, uh, without cutting anything. And then and that may, and it's, some people find that statement entirely obvious, and other people find that uh, completely obtuse. So let me try to um, explain why that that's true. In so I can't draw four dimensions. That's that's the first thing I have to admit. Um, and you know I'm not a good artist, but I, I don't think this is a failure of my art ability. Um, but let me try to argue by, by lower dimensional analog. Um, here's, a, here's a line, one, one dimension. So we'll do one plus one D. And let's imagine having two points on this line and we want to try to cross them through each other. We wanna take this one to the right and this one to the left in such a way that they end up on opposite sides of each other. And I wanna do this without crashing them into each other. And it's pretty easy to see that in fact, you can't do this. They will always crash into each other. They will never get around each other if they stay on that one dimensional line without crashing. However, if I say, oh no, I changed my mind. I'm not gonna re restrict you to one plus one dimensions. I'm gonna allow you to move in two plus one dimensions. Then it's really easy. You just take this guy off into the second dimension and move him around and he gets to the other side without crashing. He never has to touch this, this other particle um, and he can still get to the other side. Now let's think about knotted strands. Suppose I have two knotted strands like this. So this is now living in two plus one D. And I want to try to drag this through such that it goes to this without crashing. Is there any way to try to, you know, just, just focusing on this region here, um, keeping the endpoints all fixed. Um, is there any way to, to take this undercrossing into this overcrossing without the two knots, the two strands intersecting each other? No that they'll always catch on each other, they'll always get caught, and they'll always have to intersect each other in order to take this undercrossing into that overcrossing. But then if I say, no, 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 you, I'm gonna allow you to not move in two plus one D, I'm gonna allow you to move in three plus one D, you can do exactly the same thing. You can take this strand, you can shift it out into the other dim dimension, like, like I did here, move it over to the other side and reconstitute it on, in this way, such that it's now goes from being an undercrossing to an overcrossing and it never touched the other strand. So that means that I can undo any crossing and turn any overcrossing into any undercrossing and any undercrossing into any overcrossing uh, in three plus one dimensions. And I can undo any knot in, in three plus one dimensions. So in higher number of dimensions, you can't have a non-trivial knot. And it is this reason, this is fundamentally the reason that in three plus one D, one dimension, you only get uh, bosons and fermions, point particle, bosons and fermion per point particles um, in, in three plus one dimensions. And you don't get exotic particles with interesting braiding statistics, no braiding statistics. Um, uh, statistics. Now this does not mean um, that three plus one dimensional topological quantum field theories are not interesting because you can have uh, situations where there's a three plus one dimensional quantum field theory 
and its excitation is a loop, like one of these vortex loops that um, that uh, Kelvin was thinking about. You have a, a vortex loop, some, some one-dimensional object, and then you can imagine taking a point particle through this loop and back around, or can having another loop go through this loop. And that is something that uh, can form a knot in three plus one dimensions. So you can have non-trivial topology in three plus one dimensions, but you can't have uh, tri non-trivial topology of world lines, just as of point particle world lines, point particles, world lines, world lines uh, in three plus one D are always trivial, are trivial, are trivial braids. I never nodded, maybe I never, never nodded. Okay. Does that answer the question maybe? Yeah, th thank you. That was very interesting. Um, so I think maybe we should take a break. Let our speaker go. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much for this wonderful talk. My this pleasure. Very interesting.